So in the later 18th and early 19th centuries, Romanticism developed into a variety of forms, but the common connecting thread continued to be an emphasis on emotional expressiveness and the unique experiences and tastes of the individual. By this point in time, many people, especially in France, had become rather disillusioned with the Enlightenment. Sure, the Enlightenment had led to revolution, but the result of that had really been thousands of casualties and mass destruction, and yet the government was still corrupt and the poor were still trapped in awful living and working conditions. And so many people began to question if maybe truth and meaning don't come from rational logic and empirical evidence, but instead maybe they come from within oneself, from their emotions, their dreams, and kind of their imagination the things that make them individual. Um, Charles Baudelaire wrote that, quote, romanticism lies neither in the subjects that an artist chooses nor in its exact copying of truth, but in the way he feels, end quote. Romanticism will continue to explore dramatic subject matter taken from literature and history and to emphasize the importance of individual liberties, but with this new vein of intense emotional expression. Romantic artists were much more likely to depict current events and contemporary subjects than neoclassical artists were, but they also depicted scenes from their own imaginations, all with this goal of sort of stimulating the viewer's emotions. Stylistically, Romanticism tends to be rather similar to Neoclassicism, but usually Romantic artists will use sort of richer colors and warmer tones and will have more um, sort of asymmetry and maybe instability within the work, and maybe most prominently um, we'll see much more painterly brushwork. One major French Romantic artist was Theodore Jericho, and though his career was cut short by his death at just 32 years old, he had a huge impact on early 19th century art. Jericho studied in Rome in about 1816 to 17, and there he was fascinated by the work of Michelangelo. When he came back to Paris, he was determined to make a great modern history painting, and that he did. In um, this work, his 1819 Raft of the Medusa, uh, Jericho is depicting a radically contemporary event from just three years earlier. So in 1816, a French merchant vessel, the Medusa, was bound for the French colonial, um, the French colonial sediment, settlement in Senegal when it shipwrecked not far off the coast from Africa. The captain of the ship was this young, unqualified aristocrat who had recently been appointed by the newly restored monarchy of King Louis XVIII. The captain took all of the lifeboats for himself and his officers, and he left 152 people drifting on this makeshift raft. Thirteen days later, when they were finally rescued, only 15 of them had survived, and several of them had resorted to cannibalism to do so. This is a huge news story in France, and since the captain had been a political appointee, the press really used the situation to criticize the monarchy for their actions both at home and in French Senegal. And so Jericho here has depicted this sensational, kind of emotionally charged moment full of both hope and fear. He really arranges um, his figures in this sort of pyramid um, this pyramid of bodies along the raft there. Um, he did spend a lot of time studying actual corpses and severed heads and kind of amputated limbs in an effort to learn to mimic the look of decomposing flesh, but ultimately he has based his um, survivors, his figures, on live models and given them these sort of athletic bodies and vigorous gestures that sort of generalize and ennoble his subject and really elevate this very specific contemporary tragedy to a more universal level in um, hopes to sort of speak about the romantic struggle of humanity against both nature and against themselves and kind of against death as well. And um, we also have, you know, this idea of hope in the face of great despair. Um, and this also would expose the incompetence of the French government and their sort of disregard uh, for human life.
Um, so again, we have kind of this triangular composition of figures, and if you notice, we have this sort of implied diagonal line that begins in the lower left corner, sort of runs up through the bodies of the figures, and if you can kind of pick it out, several of these figures are sort of gesturing or even surging kind of towards the right side of the composition. Um, and towards where our triangle kind of peaks, and we have this man um, kind of positioned at the top of the pyramid. Um, now, this is Jericho's hero in his narrative, although it's a somewhat unconventional choice because it's not a king or even an intellectual or an aristocrat, but rather a black man from French Senegal named Jean Charles, who had showed extreme sort of physical and emotional endurance and survived this event. And so Jericho gives him the power to save everyone else by um, kind of waving his shirt over his head at this, if you can see it, this time tiny, tiny, tiny little dot of a ship that's just on the horizon there. Um, and so he has sort of suggested in a way uh, that maybe freedom often depends on sort of the most oppressed members of society. However, there's also this sense of fear that that distant ship um, might pass them by and kind of leave them stranded. We also have sort of another implied diagonal line that begins in the lower right corner of the composition and kind of runs again up through the crowd, across the raft, and up through the mast of the ship um, and sort of points to this giant wave that is building and that will potentially come crashing down on the raft at any moment. And so Jericho's figures are both sort of physically and emotionally stranded between hope um, and maybe between hope and the fear of being, you know, left or, or not seen. And then also between kind of this conflict of man versus man. And then also this, you know, fear of nature and the conflict of men and nature as well here. So really, he's kind of creating this intense tension um, within the figures and within the scene that communicates this, I don't know, sense of despair that these survivors must have been feeling during this experience. The leading romantic painter in France after Jericho's death was Eugène Delacroix, although he really considered himself to be a classicist. Delacroix depicted contemporary heroes and victims engaged in the violent struggles of his time. Um, when Napoleon was ousted in 1814, the monarchy had been restored under uh, Louis XVIII, and his power was really limited by the Constitution and the Parliament, but his successor, the ultra-conservative Charles X, had promptly um, reinstated press censorship and kind of returned education to the control of the Catholic Church, really limited voting rights. Um, and so all of these things, you know, we have this monarchy who made promises to the French people and now they're not following through. And so all of these things kind of result in a rather large scale uprising in Paris that we now refer to as the three day or the July revolution of 1830. And this toppled the monarchy yet again. Um, just a few months later, Delacroix painted this huge canvas that is partially a record of the truth, but he's also twisted the truth to sort of enhance his, his message here. So Delacroix depicts this, again, sort of a triangular composition of figures, um, and this time they are all from sort of various social classes, all dressed in contemporary clothing, and they all sort of surge forward over this barricade of refuse and dead bodies on the street. Um, we see this upper class man um, with this sort of top hat here. We also have a factory worker wearing an apron. We have this young boy with his pistols. Um, and then so death is kind of the great equalizer here. Um, we have, you know, this guy in his nightshirt who um, it's kind of referencing how the repressive French government would go into homes and kill revolutionaries and drag their bodies out into the streets as a warning to others. Um, but we also have this man who is a man in the king's army who is dead as well. Um, and so again, death is kind of this great equalizer.
Now, the leader of Delacroix's crowd um, is this muscular, goddess-like, allegorical figure of liberty, um, and she is meant to represent equality and fraternity. Um, she is also dressed in rather contemporary clothing um, of a sort of working-class woman, and if you notice, she has sort of tanned skin and underarm hair, so she's very sort of realistic. Um, her dress has ripped to bare her chest, which at the time was sort of seen as this added symbol of freedom. And then she's encouraging the crowd forward, kind of raising the French flag with one hand and then grasping a musket in the other hand. Um, she's also shown wearing this um, Phrygian cap. It's sort of a soft cloth head cover that were, it was traditionally worn by enslaved peoples in antiquity and French revolutionaries adopted it as a symbol of liberty. Um, so Delacroix also kind of, he creates this soft light that really filters through the smoke that is obscuring the background, and he illuminates just a little bit of the Parisian skyline and the Notre Dame Cathedral, sort of for context. Um, and so Delacroix, he's really representing, you know, these ideas of heroic self-sacrifice, which are very, you know, neoclassical, but with a much more sort of passionate and dramatic um, undertone, and he's kind of depicting much more raw emotions as well. Onier Daumier was a Parisian artist who was very interested in the impact of industrialization on modern urban life, specifically that of the working class. Um, he made his living selling satirical and documentary lithographic prints to um, French newspapers and magazines in the early 19th century. So lithography which literally translates to stone writing, was a new printmaking technique developed in the 1790s that really relied on the principle that oil and water do not mix. The artist would first draw their image on a flat surface, traditionally fine grain stone, um, and they would use this greasy material that would absorb into the stone's pores. Then the stone would be treated with an acid solution that fixes the drawing and prevents smudging before a solvent was used to clean away the grease. The stone would then be wiped with water, which would soak into the ungreased areas, and then an oil-based ink is applied, and that adheres to the greasy areas, but not to the damp ones. And so then the artist can sort of carefully align their paper on the stone and press, usually with a printing press, to transfer that ink. And so the advantage of lithography is that the artist can work um, sort of much more freely, um, much more like drawing, you know, on paper, and they can make several copies in a short amount of time. Um, so this is how Daumier made his money. And so after the July Revolution of 1830, um, Louis-Philippe I was installed on the throne. And again, he promised social reform, better jobs, better pay, and workers' rights, but he never followed through. And so, in April of 1834, riots broke out within the working class areas of the city um, because of protests um, against the exploitation and kind of poor living and working conditions. During the riots, a French government official or guard was killed on Rue Transnonian Street, right near where Onier Daumier lived. The responding riot squad believed the responsible party to be hiding in a working class apartment building, and so they stormed in and killed every person inside. And so Damier's print, which is aptly titled Rue Transnonian, April 15th, 1834, depicts the bloody aftermath of the violence. And this would have been published um, just a few days or maybe a week or two after the event. So very contemporary. Um, here he shows three generations of an innocent family all dead. We have the husband lying in the center of the composition in his nightgown, kind of tangled in sheets as if he was killed before he had fully made it out of his bed. Um, the diagonal sort of angle of his foreshortened body really pulls us into the scene and pulls us um, kind of in so that we notice uh, the head and arms of this murdered child that he was trying to protect. 
Um, and then his wife kind of lays in the shadows here to the left and her foreshortened diagonal body also serves to kind of pull us deeper into the scene. Um, and then we also have this elderly man, presumably a grandfather, um, lying in the foreground uh, to the right. And so Damier has kind of created strong contrasts between lights and darks that enhance the emotional impact of the scene. But he's also really documenting, you know, the horrible history, um, or excuse me, the horrible event in history in a rather romantic way. But he hasn't really, you know, he hasn't really idealized or sensationalized it. Um, he's rather giving us a sort of brutal, uh, real depiction that makes a poignant political statement about the abuse of power and excessive police force. So really since Napoleon's 1798 invasion of Egypt and his rampant uh, looting of Egyptian objects for the Louvre, which opened in 1804, uh, Europeans have been fascinated by West Asian and North African cultures. And so this is a region which they labeled the Orient. And so increased trade and travel along with imperial military campaigns and the establishment of colonial sediments, um, these really accelerated European access to foreign places, goods, people, ideas, and styles. So the term Orientalism is used to describe the European conception of North African, West, and Central Asian cultures in stereotypical ways. Um, one scholar, Edward Said, describes Orientalism as, quote, the colonial gaze upon colonized Orient, um, seen as something to possess by the colonizer and as a primitive or exotic playground by the civilized European visitor. Said also explains that the concept embodied distinctions between the East and the West precisely so that the West could control and sort of authorize the views of the East. Um, and so romantic artists were very intrigued by these exotic lands, and several of them produced works that are very sumptuous and stirring. However, they also tend to be rather problematic and somewhat sensationalized and kind of these fantastical scenes of unbridled violence and sensuality. So for example, here we have another work by Eugene Delacroix. This is from 1827, and it's titled Death of Sardanapalus. Um, here he's pulling from an eight 1821 play by the English romantic poet Lord Byron, in which Sardanapalus, the last king of the second Assyrian dynasty at the end of the 9th century BC, was besieged by an enemy army, and rather than allowing anything to fall into enemy hands, he ordered all his horses, dogs, servants, and wives to be slain before him, and all of his belongings to be destroyed. So, um, Delacroix creates this sort of sweeping diagonal composition um, that has been described by some as, quote, an orgy of death in reds, golds, and blacks. Um, he really depicts these sort of muscular men in dynamic action, kind of exerting their physicality as they, um, you know, struggle to, to um, subdue these powerful horses and kill them, and then they hold these women in um, rather kind of sexual poses as they prepare to kill them as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the figures, excuse me, actually... Um, the only source of calm kind of within the entire scene is actually um, Sardanopolis himself, who is sort of reclining kind of passively on this funeral pyre and kind of watching the scene uh, sort of voyeuristically. Um, but the, the turbans that several of these figures wear, along with the elephant heads on the posts of the bed and kind of other ornamental objects scattered throughout, these are all meant to confirm the oriental setting of the scene. And so Delacroix is seemingly expressing maybe his disillusioned views of those in power who abuse the innocent. Um, however, many European viewers saw works like these as illustrations of um, alien regions without any sort of morals or sense of restraint, and that, again, kind of reinforced ideas of white European superiority over uh, quote-unquote primitive non-white cultures, and it became somewhat of a justification for European colonialism.
I threw this in here just to kind of make a comparison between the neoclassic and the romantic. Um, and I think this is a nice comparison because we have this calm, sort of ordered rationality, a very stable composition dominated by horizontals and verticals um, and by uh, clarity, really. Um, and then with Delacroix's Death of Sardanopolis, we have this, you know, dynamic kind of diagonal composition that is just um, quite chaotic and sort of overflowing with various, you know, curving lines, and there really are hardly any true horizontals or verticals at all. Um, and if we look here at these two um, sort of uh, preliminary studies that each artist did in preparation for their larger works, I think you can really start to get a sense of the, the kind of key differences between neoclassicism and romanticism, where neoclassicism is highly rational, ordered, linear. Um, romanticism is quite the opposite. It is um, irrational, it's emotional, it's chaotic. And so David, or excuse me, Delacroix here, <clears throat> Delacroix here has not tried to, you know, accurately capture the the forms of his figures or his scene. Rather, he's trying to create sort of the feeling of, um, you know, this this dramatic kind of diagonal um, composition tipping upwards and kind of spilling out of the bottom corner of the canvas here. Uh, here's another slightly later example of European Orientalism. Uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme depicts this naked youth holding a serpent as this older man plays the flute, uh, charming both the snake and their audience. And so Jérôme has actually constructed this scene straight out of his imagination. He had never traveled to any of the regions in the so-called Orient. However, he utilizes this highly refined and kind of naturalistic style, all uh, neoclassicism um, to suggest that he himself had truly observed the scene but we also have kind of this um, you know slightly looser more painterly brushstroke in some areas that create sort of this dreamlike haze on the scene as well um, but in doing all this Jerome really suggests that nudity like this was a regular and kind of public occurrence in quote-unquote again the Orient And so Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang was perhaps David's most famous student. And while he was very kind of committed to neoclassicism and history painting, his works are often rather romanticized. Ang sought to sort of synthesize um, precise drawing, linear clarity, formal idealization, and graceful lyricism with sensually and even erotically charged imagery that truly appealed to his viewers' emotions. Drawing was incredibly important to Ang. Um, and he sort of retains this classical emphasis on defined contours and just subtle shading to create the illusion of three-dimensionality within his forms. Um, he typically would complete a very detailed monochrome underdrawing before coming back in and building up the color of his forms using thin translucent layers, which resulted in um, a sort of totally smooth finished texture with no evidence of brushwork. Um, so where Delacroix's paint is rather thick and his you know, brush strokes are visible and his forms kind of meld together. Here with Aang, we have that extreme kind of linear clarity and that precise kind of smooth uh, finished texture. Here in this work, La Grande Odalisque, um, or the Large Odalisque, um, Aang has kind of created a careful contrast between the very sensual curving contours of his nude female figure and then these rather tight angular folds of the fabric that's crumpled beneath her. The woman is reclined in this sort of twisting pose, gazing coolly over her shoulder at the viewer. Her face is a classically idealized expression of beauty and poise, but Aang has sort of strayed from idealized anatomical proportions, and he's lengthened her spine and kind of widened her hips 
And so she has these uh, sort of impossibly long back and these impossibly long arms that don't really seem to have any joints. And then her bottom leg is also in this sort of impossible position. And so these physical distortions really serve to accentuate the kind of long, sinuous, curving contour of her body and heighten the eroticism of the image, although she twists just enough that she kind of maintains her modesty. Um, he also uses these highly saturated blues that are quite harmonious with her cool kind of pale skin and her blue eyes. Um, so Aang is, he's certainly pulling from the Western tradition of reclining female nudes here. However, this is not a mythological goddess or a character from classical literature, but rather it's a contemporary woman. Um, but his justification for uh, such a public display of nudity and eroticism was that this was a woman from a foreign world where European morals didn't apply, and so that makes it okay. The title itself, the Grand Odalisque, um, that sort of indicates this exotic setting because the term Odalisque was the French term for a harem or a harem woman. And so in West and Central Asian cultures, the harem was simply a private space for the women in the household. But Europeans, especially men, conceive of the harem as more of a collection of female concubines and sex slaves. And Aang kind of includes several markers of exoticism here, like um, the hookah pipe that's down here by her foot, the turban that she wears on her head, and this sort of peacock feathered fan, which is also a phallic symbol uh, that kind of encourages the viewer to imagine the tactile sensations of the scene. Uh, what would the fabrics feel like? What would these feathers feel like? And what would the soft flesh of this woman feel like? Um, he's sort of objectifying her to the point of, you know, reducing her to just another luxurious item within this space. Um, now, Aang, he truly wanted to be a successful history painter, but honestly, he made his name through aristocratic portraiture and things like this that were really aimed at satisfying the male gaze with these fantasy women who invite their own objectification. So moving out of France for just a moment, um, 18th century Spain, they did not really take to neoclassicism as much as everyone else. Um, the most prominent Spanish painter of this period was Francisco de Goya. And so he began work for the Spanish Royal Workshop in about 1774. And then he served as a painter for Charles III. And he was the official court painter to Charles IV. Um, Goya belonged to an intellectual circle that really embraced the ideas of the French Revolution. Um, so he was, you know, an Enlightenment kind of intellectual. However, he was also a romantic. Um, and so this large portrait of the family of Charles IV really reflects Goya's situation and how he was kind of torn between his position as a court painter who was loyal to the king and then his very passionate desires for uh, reform and kind of a more open Spain. So we have a rather formal kind of stiff family portrait with the king and queen in the center and so they have been surrounded by their immediate family so this is our king and this is our queen um, Goya has not idealized his figures but rather he uses this sort of loose painterly brushstroke to render the royal family in slight caricature. Um, some of the individuals seem bored and some of them are staring kind of outside of the painting. The king himself seems somewhat dazed and the queen um, is shown with sort of a double chin here. Um, and she is looking directly out at the viewer, which some have posited was a, a sort of hint at the fact that she was having a very open affair with the prime minister at the time, so she didn't really have any secrets. Um, but the royal family was apparently satisfied with Goya's depictions of them. They accepted this. Um, and he's actually also included a self-portrait in this as well, um, kind of in the style of Velázquez and the Las Meninas uh, that we saw previously. Um, so he's also emphasizing his own kind of status and success as a painter. <laughs> 
Now, after the French Revolution, King Charles was really rather worried that a similar revolution was going to happen in Spain. Um, He reinstituted the Inquisition, he halted reform, and he even prohibited the entry of French books into the country of Spain. And so Goya and his intellectual circle really began to criticize the Spanish crown more openly. Now, as it turns out, King Charles IV was right to be worried, apparently, because in 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte launched a campaign to conquer Spain. Now, at first, the Spanish accepted the French because they brought with them political reform and a new, more liberal constitution. But when rumors started spreading that the French planned to execute the Spanish royal family, the citizens of Madrid revolted, resulting in a day of bloody street fighting and mass arrests on May 2nd, 1808. Uh, The next day, on May 3rd, hundreds of Spanish citizens were herded into a convent and executed by a French firing squad. Um, Goya created two canvases that present us with the documentation of the chaotic violence of May 2nd, as seen here. Um, But the better known of the two canvases um, is sort of this impassioned memorial Um, to the tragic loss of life that occurred on May 3rd. And so he has titled this the 3rd of May, 1808. Um, And in the composition, he focuses on the human faces of um, his rebels and kind of these dramatic, impassioned gestures that they make um, and on the sort of mechanical kind of orderly efficiency of the firing squad whose faces are turned away from us to kind of further dehumanize them and ensure that we uh, kind of relate to the victims here. Um, Also, Goya uses this sort of spotlight on this victim in a white shirt and kind of yellow pants, and he raises his arms in a pose that sort of recalls Christ being crucified on the cross, and so in a way, Goya is making him into this political martyr. And so this is certainly not the cool precision of neoclassicism or, you know, like we saw with David. Um, And he's certainly not focused on civil sacrifice, but rather he's created this image of war as a sort of miserable affair rather than a glorious one. And it's sort of filled with terror and desperation. Goya's focus on humanity and the sensational current events are both right at this essence of romanticism. Um, He also uses implied lines to kind of keep the viewer's eye moving around to the different parts of the scene, and he sort of encircles, again, his political martyr, his victim here. Um, There is no moralizing lesson, though. Instead, his loose brushwork and the sort of dramatic lighting really emphasize Goya's hopeless rage at the corrupt inhumanity of war. This was not commissioned uh, by any patron, actually. Um, Goya just simply thought it was important to paint, and so he did it. And later, when he was asked why, he responded, quote, to warn men never to do it again. Between about 1796 and 98, Goya produced a series of about 80 etchings titled Los Capricios, aimed at ordinary people, Um, and in them he used supernatural themes to kind of satirize the ignorant, corrupt, and violent world around him. This work, titled The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters, was intended as the first in the series as sort of a title page, and it really reflects Goya's idea behind the entire series, that reason ignored is a sleeping monster. And so in this, he has presented us with um, this figure that is shown asleep at a desk. Now, this has been interpreted as the personification of reason, or perhaps as an artist whose reason and kind of rational side have, has fallen asleep. Um, but behind the figure, we have this rather irrational host of nightmarish creatures that are haunting him. We have owls, bats, cats, and a lynx. Um, all of these are animals that Spanish folk traditions associate with uh, mystery and with evil. And if you notice, some of them are staring sort of directly at us, kind of forcing us to become more active participants in the image. Over here to the left, we have this little owl that's on the desk, and he's picking up um, these drawing pencils and paintbrushes and kind of pushing them towards the man. 
Um, down here on the front of the desk, we have the title of the print. And then Goya uh, wrote a caption that complements and kind of complicates, honestly, this message. Um, his caption said, Imagination abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters. United with her, she is the mother of the arts and the source of its wonders. In some ways, this kind of seems anti-romantic, because shouldn't we be abandoning reason and letting our feelings guide us? But really what Goya is saying here is that imagination and reason must work together, uh, not only to make art, but to succeed as a society. Um, other prints in this series really emphasized uh, the follies of Spanish society, kind of in this effort to incite action and alert Spanish people to the errors of their ways and to kind of reawaken them to the ideas of uh, the Enlightenment, but also to the imagination. Now, after the French invasion, when the Spanish monarchy was restored, King Ferdinand VII abolished the new constitution and reinstated the Inquisition once more. In 1814, Goya was sent to the Inquisition and charged with obscenity for an earlier painting of a female nude figure. He was soon acquitted and he retired to his home outside of Madrid, where he vented his anger at the world in this series of dark, ghoulish paintings on the walls of his home which are now referred to as his black paintings. Now there are several of these, I think there are about 15 if I remember correctly, um, but this particular one is titled Saturn Devouring One of His Children, and it references the story of the Titan Saturn who was haunted by this prophecy that one of his sons would dethrone him as the god of time. And so to prevent this, he simply devoured his children at birth. Jupiter, however, escapes and grows up and fulfills the prophecy. And so perhaps Goya intended this as sort of an allegory for his ideas about power and how leaders treat their subjects to maintain that power. Many romantic artists look to the natural world as an alternative to the highly ordered rational world of the enlightenment and industrialization. Contemplation of nature was thought to lead to self-discovery and the ever-changing, unpredictable, uncontrollable aspects of nature were thought to be analogous to human emotions. They found nature to be awe-inspiring and many sought to depict nature in its most sublime through seemingly infinite vistas, mountains, oceans, waterfalls, storms, and sort of wild untamed lands, all of which speak to the overwhelming power of nature that tends to dwarf humanity and kind of sparks this fascination, excitement, and fear uh, that makes that sense of the sublime. One important British Romantic landscape artist was John Constable, and Constable tends to be, um, you know, on the quieter side of the Romantic landscape painting. Um, he was born in Suffolk, and he moved to London in 1816, where he trained at the Royal Academy and was influenced by 17th century Dutch landscape painting traditions. Constable sought to express his own kind of personal responses and emotions towards his native English countryside. These are highly subjective personal views of nature that really reflect the individuality of Romanticism. This quiet, slow-moving scene titled The Hay Wagon depicts the Stour River Valley, which is often referred to as Constable Country. Um, and it depicts it in the way that he thought of it, this sort of comfortably rural and idyllic area. Um, and so in a way, he's really expressing this sense of nostalgia for the agrarian past that was quickly being replaced by um, industrialization. This work was one of what Constable referred to as his six footers. So it's a roughly six foot wide canvas um, because he really felt that the agricultural landscape was just as important as history painting. So he started producing these radically large landscape canvases. Um, this work was also known for its radical use of color uh, because Constable has used pure colors like bright green as one would see it in nature and then he balances the bright kind of pure green with these pure reds on the horse's saddles. 
Um, Constable's broad brushwork and kind of loose handling of paint were also considered radical. Um, notice how he uses uh, kind of loose, almost splotchy brushwork in the foliage, but then here in the water, he has kind of applied paint and then scraped it across the canvas to create these areas of um, highlights and reflections. Constable's works tend to have this sense of visual exactitude because of their careful attention to detail. He did numerous studies, including in-depth scientific studies of trees and plants to enhance the realism of his later paintings, but he also did quick yet accurately detailed plein air studies executed with short kind of brush strokes and in restricted color palettes to help train his hand and his eye to create uh, more spontaneous and kind of fragmentary compositions, which he felt had a much greater capacity to engage viewers' imaginations and emotions. He was especially interested in painting the sky, which he considered to be landscape's, quote, chief organ of sentiment, and he wanted to depict it in a more expressive way. He was also very interested in the emerging science of meteorology, and he studied the first systematic classification of cloud forms titled Researches About Atmospheric Phenomena, published in 1815, and he also studied the climate of London, published in 1818. Um, he did lots of uh, these little studies of the sky and clouds that have no evident horizon line, and he really focused on trying to capture nature's most ephemeral occurrences, um, and he would often note things like the season, the time, the wind directions, or other aspects of the weather conditions, so that when he returned to his studio to work on his final composition, he would have all the details that he needed. Another prominent English Romantic painter was J.M.W. Turner, who achieved full membership in the Royal Academy at the unusually young age of 27. Turner exhibited large-scale oil paintings of grand natural scenes, often paired with historical subjects, and they really tend to capture this sense of the sublime. As Edmund Burke argued, when we experience things that instill fascination mixed with fear, or when we stand in the presence of something far larger than ourselves, our feelings tend to transcend normal ones and reach into the sublime. And Turner really wanted to capture that. So, for example, this work, Snowstorm, Steamboat Off a of Harbor's Mouth from 1842, really demonstrates Turner's search for nature at its most sublime. He claimed to have tied himself to the mast of a ship during such a storm so that he could physically experience its sensations. And that's maybe not true, but it does kind of reflect his desires to express uh, the, you know, excitement and the sort of sensory overload of such a situation. Um, Turner's works really capture the savage, overwhelming power of nature that dwarfs humanity. And because the viewer experiences all of this vicariously through the painting, there are no real threats or dangers. And so the thrill and excitement can often evoke the transcendent power of God. However, Turner often used um, this concept to emphasize the turbulent relationship between the untamed natural world and the domesticated urban one. So for example here, the steamboat is representative of humanity's futile efforts to combat the powerful forces of nature. In this work, Turner has combined history painting with these monumental views of the awesome power of nature. This work references Hannibal, the famous leader of the Carthaginian army, who led his troops across the Alps to face Rome in about 218 BC. Although, Hannibal himself is really just barely visible, kind of back here along the horizon line, um, silhouetted as he's riding his elephant um, kind of along, along the mountain paths. Um, Turner probably meant this as an allegory of the Napoleonic Wars and of Bonaparte's own crossing of the Alps just a few years prior. But rather than focusing on an individual leader, this work emphasizes the victims of the conflict and kind of these soldiers who are now left struggling in the harsh kind of mountain conditions. And it really expresses humanity's vulnerability when we are faced with the incredible power of nature. Um, this huge sort 
of swirling elemental vortex of wind and snow kind of consumes the landscape and blots out the sun and looms over these figures, reminding the viewer that ultimately nature is in control. Here, Turner commemorates the contemporary events of October 16, 1834, when a fire raged through London's historic Houses of Parliament. The fire was a national tragedy, and tens of thousands of Londoners, including Turner himself, gathered on the banks of the Thames River to watch. He made several quick sketches in pencil and in watercolor from various vantage points, including one perspective um, from a rented boat that he took out onto the river. Um, and then he took all these studies back to his studio where he composed this final painting. Um, so this is sort of documentary, but it's also a study of the brilliant sort of light and color. Um, Turner depicts the flames that kind of engulf the buildings that dominate the sky and that reflect in the water with these sort of spiraling kind of energetic brush strokes and these kind of splatters of rich colors and this truly exemplifies why sometimes Turner is called the painter of light. And then here's just one more work by Turner, um, and this one really demonstrates his interest in contemporary color theory, and he's really achieved these luminous um, colors and kind of this interesting combination of colors as well. He's truly pushing the emotional and psychological effects of color combined with his loose gestural brushwork to kind of maximize the emotional intensity of his landscape scenes. Again, he creates this swirling natural vortex, which is sort of abstract, and it's initially rather beautiful. But the subject matter here, even though it's somewhat obscured, is quite heavy. Um, so again, he's combined contemporary events with this sensational landscape scene. Now, by this point in time, slavery was illegal in Britain, but it had not been that way for very long, and it was still being practiced elsewhere, and there was some talk of trying to reinstate the practice. Um, so Turner is actually referencing an event from about 60 years prior, before slavery was outlawed in England, in which an English slave ship captain, sailing into this storm, threw all the sick and dying Africans overboard so that he could make an insurance claim on lost cargo. Now, this was a policy which was banned in Britain in 1807 that really facilitated the growth of the transatlantic slave trade because captains knew that it was an option, and so they would purposefully overfill their ships and then collect the insurance money. And so Turner has returned once more to this romantic theme of humanity's kind of struggle for existence, and he juxtaposes the overwhelming power of nature with the overwhelming evil of humanity. And so the turbulent brushstrokes and the intense colors here really heighten the emotionality of the scene. And then we have these tiny figures that have been thrown overboard with shackles still sort of attached to their wrists and ankles that are really being dwarfed by nature and they're kind of sinking under the rough waves and being eaten by carnivorous fish. And so Turner is sort of asking the viewer to really contemplate human morality and He's kind of using the concentrated rage of Mother Nature and unleashing it upon this ship as a way to imply a sort of divine retribution. Caspar David Friedrich was a German romantic painter who used landscape as a vehicle to achieve spiritual revelation. Friedrich viewed landscapes to as these sort of direct connections with God's awesome power, and he developed landscape scenes as a new way to represent religious ideas within the Age of Enlightenment. Um, Friedrich once said, quote, a painter should paint not only what he sees before him, but also what he sees within himself, which really connects to that sort of individuality of romanticism. Friedrich sketched in nature, but he composed his paintings in his studio, uh, like many other romantic landscape artists, so that he could synthesize his sketches with his own memories of and feelings about nature. So this particular work is titled Abbey in an Oak Forest, and it's from about 1809 to 1810. And he's depicted here this funeral procession of monks that are just barely visible in the gloom of this oak grove. The silhouettes of the figures and kind of the, the dark trunks of the trees and um, 
the sort of huge gothic ruins. All of this contrasts with the white snow and then the bright sky. Um, and so there's sort of a kind of, I don't know, an idea of the passage of time or maybe the transience of life here. Um, and this composition contains sort of a quiet expression of maybe grief or, or you know, the sense of loss of the past. The abbey and the graveyard are kind of falling apart, but the oaks are older, and while they seem to be dead now, they will regrow in the spring and live longer. Um, Friedrich is kind of underscoring this idea that um, whatever nature creates will continue, but what man creates is transient. Um, he also includes just the tiniest little sliver of a crescent moon here, which will, you know, as time passes, it will kind of move throughout the sky until it is kind of beyond the scene, um, which evokes the infinite nature of the cosmos. Um, but we can also read the moon as kind of a point of hope. It is waning now, but it will wax again. And so we have this hope of sort of resurrection or rebirth and new life. Here's another work by Friedrich. This one is actually the companion piece for Abbey in an Oak Forest. Um, this one is titled Monk by the Sea. And so here we have this tiny little monk on the shore, kind of looking out at the low, uninterrupted horizon line over the sea. We have this rich blue, almost black water that is flecked with white, kind of implying strong winds and choppy waves. And then the lower and middle parts of the sky are much darker and kind of more turbulent, as if we have kind of this storm rolling through or maybe this, you know, fog or haze. But it gives way to a much sort of lighter, calmer, clearer blue in the upper part of the canvas, again, conveying maybe this sense of hope. The monk is really the only vertical element in the entire composition, and he's truly dwarfed by the landscape, seemingly kind of helpless in the face of um, the incomprehensibly sublime aspects of nature. There's something sort of haunting about this scene, and it's likely due to the ambiguity here. Uh, when a landscape is covered in fog, it appears larger and more sublime, and it sort of heightens the strength of the viewer's imagination. And so <clears throat> the kind of haze that permeates the scene intensifies that feeling. There's this emphasis on solitude and a sort of self reflective contemplation of life that involves a comparison of the power and vastness of the human mind to that of nature. And then this sense of um, sort of a resulting realization about the insignificance of humanity. But again, we also have this sense of hope that kind of communicates, you know, a message along the lines of this too shall pass and so don't don't become too bogged down uh, by it at this point in time here's one more um, romantic landscape painter um, this is thomas cole and so he was born in england but he immigrated to the united states at the age of 17 um, and he started working as a portrait painter then in the late 1820s and early 1830s, he traveled throughout Europe before returning and settling in New York, where he became one of the first great professional landscape painters in the country. Cole wrote about American landscapes and how they lacked the historical monuments that Europe had. However, he argued that what made them interesting was um, the natural wonders of America. And he said that we should really view these as America's antiquities. Um, he would often make sketches from observation, but again, like most other romantic landscape painters, he produced his final compositions within his studio. And so this monumental sort of panoramic view depicts a specific place and a specific time. Um, Cole gives us this sweeping view of a particular spot on the Connecticut River um, that makes this sort of large rounded curve, which is referred to as an oxbow. Um, and he's kind of showing us this from the top of Mount Holyoke in western Massachusetts. And so while this is an actual spot, Cole has still exaggerated various parts like the steepness of the mountain and kind of the dramatic storm in the sky um, to really stress the grandeur and significance of the scene. <clears throat> 
Um, Cole sort of divides his composition into two halves, um, two unequal halves, really. Um, and that really serves to contrast the two sides of the American landscape. So on the left, we have this sort of wild, untamed landscape beneath this ominous storm. And if you notice, this tree in the foreground has been sort of blasted with lightning, again, emphasizing the sublime power and maybe even the danger of nature. To the right, though, Cole depicts a more sort of peaceful pastoral landscape that has been bent to the will of humanity. We see orderly farmland, animals, settlements, and even a couple of boats along the river here. Um, and so, you know, the wilderness on this side has been tamed, and maybe we could read the storm as sort of receding into the distance and suggesting that this land is bountiful and kind of ready to yield its fruits to human civilization. So in some ways, Cole is sort of expressing this sense of manifest destiny or the uh, divine obligation of Americans to settle the western regions of the country. Um, also, if you notice, he's included a little um, self-portrait in, in this composition. So here is his backpack and his little umbrella kind of out here on the rocky outcropping. But then here he is kind of down within uh, the foliage in the brush, um, standing with an easel. And he's actually just sort of paused um, his work and he's kind of looking back over his shoulder at us, um, which potentially serves to kind of pull us deeper into uh, this composition. Um, but Cole goes on to, again, be a highly influential American landscape painter, and he actually founds the Hudson River School, which was not a true school, but rather it was a group of New York artists who um, were very much influenced by Cole and kind of interested in his ideas. And so they also will produce uh, numerous uh, kind of romantic landscape paintings during this period.